Hello, everyone. Welcome to Libraries and Recovery, part 43 uh, in our series, our long running series since March of last year uh, when the pandemic hit. And we started asking questions about the nature of libraries if the buildings are closed. Um, and many of you have joined us through the through this series. Uh, this image we've used a couple of times and and we want to use it again today to discuss connectivity among different uh, facilities. Uh, notably, you can see the library uh, and a school connected and also remote locations. This is kind of the crux of what we think is a big opportunity around the current uh, uh, emergency uh, E-rate fund. And we'll get into that. We are the Gigabit Libraries Network, uh, and we are we've been uh, producing these in a partnership with the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, IFLA.org, based in The Hague, and our trustee partner, Stephen Weiber, the head of public policy at the controls there. Uh, our session sponsor again today is Kelly Dry Warren uh, and one of our workshop leaders, uh, Steve Augustino, who is partner there and an ace in all things E-rate and all things FCC related. So um, we're setting this up as a workshop, as actually a working session, uh, rather than presentations by, you know, for different people, librarians or anyone talking about specific topics. Uh, instead, we wanted to get into the nuts and bolts, some of the how to of filing. It doesn't have to be complicated, but it can be really effective if, uh, if people, if institutions who do not normally file take an opportunity to put something in this time. And so John and Steve are back with us. You'll recognize them from prior sessions. So this was the first response uh, that libraries did to extend the signal uh, after the pandemic was declared was just to turn the router to the window and and uh, boost the signal uh, out around the building because that was the only place people could connect. And that's a lot of people that were dependent upon that. As uh, you'll recall, as tens of millions of people rely on libraries for internet access. The second step, which should have happened a year ago, is to explore uh, ways to extend that service, library Wi-Fi in effect, farther from the library. Um, this has advantages, not just to make it more convenient to the community, which is a major advantage, but also to alleviate the burden on people to have to go to the library to access that service. When you think about all the time it takes and even the perhaps uh, hazards of travel in, on uh, public transportation, it, it makes a lot of sense to distribute this really essential service that libraries provide. So that many people, roughly 80 million people were doing that, but they had to be at one of those 17,000 facilities. And so the choices now are the parking lot or a checkout hotspot or what, and that's what we're kind of getting into today because we think that the, the new uh, fund uh, supports more than just those two choices. So um, we're offering up our own situation uh, for the workshop and I hope others have brought their, their own ideas and their own plans to file and we can talk about any of those. We've got two really sharp people uh, willing to help out anybody that's interested in doing this. We filed uh, a, a comment on the Shelby petition to encourage the collaboration between schools and libraries. It's unbelievable how few they actually are, but since these two institutions are specifically identified and treated equally under, under the E-rate program, it seems like an excellent opportunity for them to collaborate on utilizing these funds because it's just not enough money to you know, outfit every single student in the country that doesn't have a home connection. It's just not. So uh, there's gonna, it's gonna be necessary, at least is our view, for uh, some of these 
locations, these new extensions to be shared to be uh, in kind of community places, maybe student study centers or some other kind of homework hotspot or uh, or access stations for any learners, including, of course, library patrons. So our first point that we're looking to make a comment on here is that we think that libraries, we don't think it is just a fact, libraries have been getting a, a disproportionately smaller amount of the E-rate funds every year than have the schools. There are a number of reasons for that. You know, one is, is, is the, the administrative overhead for small libraries is, is just too cumbersome. Uh, and it, since it also requires filtering, libraries generally are averse to that and some will opt out on that reason alone. But in this case, we're going to we're going to try to reassert that equity point, if you can, and, and that given that libraries, uh, library facilities and school facilities are roughly eight to one ratio, we translating to roughly 12% of all facilities that are eligible, we would assert and, and would like to in our comment uh, that uh, that proportion that 12% of the 7.1 billion be allocated for library use whatever kind of plan they have. Well, that's roughly $850 million. So that's a starting point. And that uh, that those funds be spent on the most co cost effective systems. It's a question as to whether or not uh, it's gonna allow any building of new wireless extensions or whether we're all, these are just gonna be spent on uh, devices and portable routers. It's, it's an open question. We would source not uh, want it to be restricted only to those routers, but obviously they are uh, valuable to a lot of people. They're so valuable, I never would understand why anybody would want to return it. Uh, but uh, even that is too much for the fund to supply to everyone. Um, but if they are restricted to these mobile routers, and that's a question I have for our uh, workshop leaders, then uh, could not these same units, just because they are mobile, doesn't mean that they have to be used in a mobile, could they not, because they're relatively low cost, uh, could they not be used to anchor fixed locations for libraries or for schools for that matter? And so for us, that's an interesting proposition and it, one that allows the schools and the libraries to collaborate on locating those. We've seen this in the past, some of our projects where that's happened, where both institutions kind of understand where the greatest needs are in their communities. And so uh, typically the library has been the one that sets those up because that's what they do is make uh, uh, public uh, access open to the public. And, and so this is an ideal kind of opportunity for that kind of a collaboration. This is a screenshot from our filing uh, uh, in in, uh, a, a com uh, in a comment on the Shelby petition uh, for allowing these uh, remote funds. So that's kind of our, our document that we would want to sort of reassert and then add uh, maybe a couple of additional points. And this is just some simple math to, I think, support the case for libraries using these portable checkouts as fixed uh, though we think it's a little bit short-sighted because, you know, it's just a service agreement for X number of months. But if we use the two years, which is a, the presumed emergency period, and um, uh, that at roughly $500 for that 24 months for one of these checkout hotspots at the, the lowest rate, frankly, uh, that would be... Uh, 50 mil, only $50 million to, to add one in every neighborhood in the country with, if we use a, uh, a definition of a neighborhood, that there's approximately 100,000 of those around the country. That would be a pretty powerful use and a pretty low cost way to provide uh, a secondary or a primary access for, for people and something can be done most quickly. And, and which of course, if you're in an emergency, that is a value point. So, uh, even if we go with the fixed wireless and using uh, you know, various kinds of technologies to, to anchor those, even at a $5,000 price per station, it's still only 500, only 500 million, 
which is still less than what we would say is a proportional share uh, for libraries under the under the seven billion, seven point one billion. So that's our that's our proposition anyway, and so that's the kind of the the filing that we're looking to make. Uh, it supports this idea that everybody should be close to some kind of a library outlet, uh, you know, like walking distance. Um, this is a list of, of projects that describe different ways that that's been implemented. And it's on the community second nets page at giglibraries.net. And these are examples of, of service models and wireless technologies. And each one of these has its own story, a report, and even a video on how they've done these things. And I, I recommend them because it's just an interesting uh, group of projects that uh, can, that have learned a lot. And you, you might want to emulate any of these or come up with your own method. And these are just some shots of possible stations that, uh, that have been set up and around. These laundromats are a pretty impressive site when you think about uh, people who have to spend hours sitting next to their laundry with not much to do. What a great place for a library facility. And then this is our favorite uh, kind of kiosk, if you will, uh, where it's set up as a library remote access point with a charging facility and a comfortable setting. And then there's also even solar panels on the uh, awning there. So let's get to the, to the shop here. Um, I think we'll ask John to basically lead us through the session today uh, and kind of set us up. There are a number of questions that are outstanding on the, on the, uh, uh, the filing. Uh, and then Steve, uh, who cannot really weigh in on recommendations, but on techniques and tips for how to do that. Uh, he's advising a number of people and so in so doing, uh, Kelly Dry is not a position to take specific uh, positions on different kinds of steps. So with that, I am going to stop sharing and I am going to turn it over to John Harrington. Welcome back, both of you, John and Steve. Uh, take us away, John. Tell us how you'd like to kind of map this out. Yeah, I think uh, it, and I'll, the... I'll ask everybody to... Uh, submit questions uh you know in the chat and if you'd like to you know pose a your own proposal uh for kind of an open discussion we're happy to have that so thank you john absolutely and i think what we'll do is uh the shelby organization uh john winhausen uh, was with us last week was that last week feels like a year ago COVID years uh I actually had a very good list of issues and our thought was today we would just sort of walk through these different questions that are posed by the FCC uh, and uh, just sort of talk about what they mean and what people's thoughts and ideas on them and I think I think that's another area that Steve can help not necessarily answer the question but in some some of these help us understand what really is the FCC asking? You know, what's the, the, the framework or the context for this question? Um, I, I wanna make two points before this though. Number one, I wanna say that, you know, this $7 billion fund, this one-time opportunity is, is you know, it's, it's a significant amount of, of, of funds. I think it also is a, an audition, a, uh, a stepping stone to potential ongoing sustainable support for the digital divide. And I think it's very important that we, we understand the context. Uh, it's funny, I was helping my daughter, uh, my youngest daughter, who's a junior in high school this week, uh, working on a uh, US history homework assignment about the New Deal. And, you know, the 1930s, early 1930s, and all these different programs and laws, and some of them were effective, some of them weren't. And, and I was struck by the fact that how many of those we are still living with, for better and for worse. Uh, and it just, it, it just brought home to me the significance of this moment we have today, because I believe that this project will probably influence the next project that we may all be living with for decades. So we wanna see this done and done well. Uh, and not only do we want those resources deployed, uh, 
we also want them spent. <laughs> uh, here is a scenario that that troubles me. There's $7 billion set aside for remote learning to connect schools and libraries. And let's say even for some very good reasons, maybe just half of that money gets used. You know, maybe it's a complex application, whatever, but for whatever reason, $3 billion of those dollars aren't spent. To the uninitiated, they may look at that and say, oh, well, look, the digital divide's taken care of. We, we, we sent $7 billion over there to take care of the digital divide. They only needed three, you know, um, which is not the case at all. Uh, and we would all sort of understand that, but from a very high level policy perspective, translating that all the way up and filtering it up to the, you know, the talking points, uh, it's, 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 a, it's, it's, a, there's some, there's risk and reward potential and, and uh, some real potential downsides, I think. So we want it, it's, it's in everyone's best interest for this program to, to work well, to address the needs that are in the community, to get more of those kiosks that, that Don pointed out. Related to that is the fact that you have a, the opportunity to have a very large voice, a very loud voice. Again, $7 billion of millions of individuals that are on the wrong side of the digital divide. To date, there's been a little more than 100 comments filed to the FCC. Uh, that's, you know, that's a good number. Uh, if, if you submit one comment, you might be 1% of the comments, <laughs> you know, uh, in helping to inform the, the Federal Communications Commission on, on the work that they're going to do. So, you know, a lot of times in these sorts of debates, we're talking about, you know, tens of thousands of voices or millions of voices talking about issues. And, and really, it is a very small group that uh, has the ear of the FCC. So it is that is the context for this discussion. Like, it is important that this is done well, and you have the opportunity really to have an outsized, outsized voice for who you are. You know, and I, I, I mean that in the kindest way. Like, any one of us are, uh, are, you know, our, our scope of influence here is is much larger than it would appear because of just the, the number. Uh, Steve, you're unmuted. Do you want to say something? Yeah, I was, I was just going to echo that point. Um, you know, I'll go through this a little bit and talking about filing tips, but, um, you know, this is an opportunity to round out the record and provide, you know, specific examples or specific um, reasons why the commission should want to make the program be more effective for you, right? Congress passed this legislation to assist schools and libraries in solving that remote challenge. So that's the purpose of this. This is a chance for you to provide information that the FCC can use and put into its order to help to give meaning to the program. Okay, so let's start with the first question because I think it actually goes to Mala's point. So let me share this. Uh, and again, this is a list of uh, questions that uh, John Windhausen at the Shelby Group uh, put together for us. And uh, we are shamelessly using it, but we, we're giving him credit. So it's not plagiarism, right? If you, uh, if you uh, <laughs> I'm way out of my league here. I'm dealing with uh, librarians <laughs> and you guys are much more sensitive than I am to some of these issues. Uh, so the first done. question here is, should the fund be used for the deployment of additional network facilities. And, you know, Mala raises a really good point about sustainability. You know, if, if we're just getting funds for a short time, how does, how does this, you know, really move the, the, the dial? What does this look like in six months? And I think that is completely wrapped up in this first question. There is, I think, an assumption by the FCC, at least in its initial, uh, document kind of asking for feedback that these funds would be solely for recurring services, 50 bucks a month for this particular type of connection. 
And then when the money's gone, it stops. Uh, and uh, the, the alternative there is allowing schools and libraries the opportunity to enhance, to upgrade, to extend their existing network facilities so that you know, instead of just a monthly recurring services uh, service, in some cases, uh, there may be scenarios where you could extend your Wi-Fi across the street or put in a connection that goes to that kiosk that does not require a monthly recurring service. It's a, you know, a wireless connection and therefore would uh, allow you to you know, get the benefit of that for, on an ongoing basis, regardless of the, the monthly fee you know, the, the funds being gone, it could outlive the fund itself. Uh, and I think that is the type of argument that, uh, you know, that there's, the FCC has two, two uh, well, well, there's some, there's guardrails. They've got some significant limitations, you know, they, on, on what Congress has sort of told them they can do and also what they have the authority to do. Uh, you know, they could not turn around and say these funds should be used to build, uh, you know, physical bridges, right? They, 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 they can't build roadways, physical roadways with these dollars. That's an extreme example. It's silly, but it sort of paints the picture that there are limits. And at some point, the FCC would say, yeah, it's important to have a bridge over that river, but we can't use these funds for that. We don't have the authority to do that. So, so one of the questions that the FCC is grappling with is where does their legal authority end? How far can they authorize the utilization of these funds? And then within that, still, where does it make the most sense? And, and some of those laws we can't change, but to the extent that it is within the FCC's sandbox, uh, making the case for some of these uh, questions is a really important one. And I think this, this question here to me is one of the most significant. Uh, it, it, you know, Don, wouldn't you agree? Uh, I, I would, John. Um, but I'm, I'm struggling with how to make the case for cost effectiveness or whatever term we would use to prioritize the approach of uh, of uh, these fixed connections. So buying equipment to create a direct link with a remote kiosk or access station uh, would, could be a one-time cost of hardware. That cost could be, you know, a few thousand dollars. So is that more cost effective to have a, a like a permanent link to a, a community station uh, as it would to spend $500 to, for a mobile connection that would, as you say, uh, end or, or continue if you paid more uh, over that period of time. So how do, we, how do we make those determinations or how do we assert the flexibility to make those kinds of determinations? I think part of the answer to that lies in this question here. Uh, should the FCC implement a budget approach like category two? Uh, you know, the, the context of that question is primarily, hey, there's $7 billion. It's a lot of money, but it's not unlimited. How should those dollars be prioritized, allocated? Should we, you know, put a, a, a limit on what can be, what the price of a, of a service is or a price of a device? Should we put a limit on how much an applicant can receive? Uh, the, uh, if, if, if you can just fund anything, then it's a real problem because there's, on, there's only $7 billion. It's a ridiculous statement, right? Uh, <laughs> there's only $7 billion. Uh, and the, you know, if, if you just fund everything, then you might fund nothing you know, for some people because it's, just, it's all going to be spent. So how do you... Uh, how do you prioritize the funding? And the essence of this budget approach is giving uh, libraries and schools a, a maximum reimbursement amount up to which they can request. 
an advantage of that is then I think it it builds into the debate this under underlying framework that says, hey, this is about cost effectiveness. You know, it's not the sky is the limit. It's a limited fund. There are limited resources. Each applicant has the opportunity to get some funding, but it's 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 capped at a certain point. So they're going to want to think long and hard about how they spend those funds, make sure that they're used effectively. And so I think it helps answer that question of the trade-off of, uh, you know, in if we could pause time, there's a lot of things we would do, you know, but in the context of this discussion, if we could pause time in an idealized state, you know, I think each applicant would just write down kind of what their needs are and send those into USAC and say, hey, we need this, we want to do that. You know, we'd have Zoom calls with them and sort of deliberate it to talk about what works best and even have this kind of discussion. Is that cost effective? What's what's the best use of the public's funds? You know, uh, that would be fantastic. Uh, we you know, we that that process would probably take a year or two and then we could turn the turn the switch back on in time and boom, you know, emergency connectivity fund. Let's get the funding out quickly. The reality is we need to get the funds out and the resources out quickly into the community but there's not time for this, this big debate, discussion, uh, negotiation with the fund administrator. So how do, you, uh, how do you resolve that? And I think that using a budget type approach, and here I'm advocating, things Steve's not gonna do, uh, the, that you know, for this type of approach, that it, it, it frees up then the library to make some of those trade-off discussions and decisions it, and to sort of run the math themselves and think about, well, what makes sense in our community for our patrons in this situation, given these facts, given maybe these other funds that we have or these other resources that we have, this is what works the best for us. And I can tell you in my experience of almost 25 years working with schools and libraries on E-rate applications, Every situation, uh, while there are some common themes, is very unique, very specific to that particular community. And it's very difficult to find solutions that, that easily address every scenario, unless it is something broad that gives that, that local library the, the opportunity to make that decision. Does that make sense? Yeah, it absolutely does. Uh, and Beverly supports the C2 approach, uh, category two approach for these deployments. Um, but you, you make a great point about, the, you know, in the context of cost effectiveness uh, is the priority of expediency, right? I mean, this, the name of this thing is the emergency fund. And that means, you know, respond quickly, not take two years to build some new thing. As you made earlier your, in your statement earlier on, that's what this starts to set up. We'll learn a lot of things. We'll establish a number of precedents in doing this, hopefully in a, a, a relatively expedient way that can lead to downstream precedents for how we continue to build out. We have a, quite a bit of a way to go yet, certainly in terms of uh, connecting all our libraries with fiber we're, we're way long from that goal. So uh, there's a balance there of how long it should take to implement any solution. And what would you say? You think there's a, actually a time frame that, that all of any solution should be live? John? Uh, in, in, in terms of, of which time frame are you talking about? The solution no, for spending the, spending this money. Oh, like like when it should be spent for each applicant to have uh, to have done something so, by when. Uh, well, one of the questions actually, I believe it's on this list. Sorry to be sort of scrolling in everyone. Uh, I thought it was on the list. Maybe it's not. Uh, that that is kind of one of the questions. Even should the the funds be? Oh yeah, right here. Um, should the ECF funds apply retroactively? Uh, so should these be, you know, one school of thought says 
this is about this could all be used just for reimbursements you know for technology or all the chromebooks that have been purchased over the past year like you could just you could just focus this whole thing towards reimbursements for things that have already been done period another school of thought is hey, let's just make this for new new things still related to the pandemic the ongoing challenges faced by libraries trying to keep communities connected uh, let's let's just forward face it and you know and then there's i think the broadest umbrella would be to allow both of those and you know that's clearly uh, my perspective and it, it goes hand in hand with this category two budget type system okay mm -hmm. it's limited uh, it's it's a significant amount of funding but it's limited and in that space allow that library to decide what types of solutions make sense and or you know is it about a reimbursement for prior expenditures or a reimbursement for new expenditures uh, if we use uh if we supported and they adopted the category two approach would that still allow third-party services uh what type of third-party services like you mean like uh like a, a, a checkout hotspot yeah absolutely yeah it would be in all of the above so uh -huh. it's and that's separate it, you you don't have to uh, you know what's eligible is a different question than uh how is it capped okay so those are two distinct questions. So, you know, the, the, the question here, there's a question about should the FCC expand the list of eligible equipment? Uh, the, uh, there's uh, several questions kind of around the issue of what's, what's eligible, uh, where are services allowed? So that would be the, this question here around locations. And then how is it, how is it capped? Or how is it prioritized? And I and and those those are the fundamental building blocks of this entire debate. You know what will qualify, and where is it at, uh, and then how is it prioritized? Uh, how is it limited? And th those are the really fundamental threads I think that that really weave their way through this discussion. There are some other more administrative aspects, questions, uh, you know, like for example, there's the question here, should the FCC require competitive bidding or, uh, you know, should there be a 30 day filing window? Those are important issues, important details. Uh, by and large, I think that those are uh, important things to know i you know i don't for example if it's a 45 day window or a 30 day window or a 60 day window i know from experience that most people are going to do most of their application work the last half of it you know like so um, i'm not as concerned whether it's a 30 day window or a 60 day window uh, i think giving giving applicants a good amount of time is important but the the real meaty substantive issue what what qualifies for support and uh, again, I think that if you have a category two type budget, maximum reimbursement amount, then it makes great sense to give a library the opportunity to uh, purchase Wi-Fi hotspots uh, or to lease a service or to extend their network. And, and it goes back to that idea of not trying to define the solution because the situations can all be so different. And in some situations, it may make the most sense to pay a monthly service. Hey, we need to get 50 of these Wi-Fi hotspots for the next 12 months. And that, you know, that's about all we can handle. You know, as from a technical standpoint, just with our staff that we have, the situation, this makes great sense. You know, we wouldn't want to take that option off the table. It's, it's about expanding the options and can you have additional options or is it really limited to a monthly service? So in a, uh, uh, in, by the way, I agree with you, Beverly, a 60 day window would be good. Uh, if the, the most narrow interpretation of this 
program would say it's only services that it, you know it's only a service you can get from a cellular provider or a local telephone company or cable tv provider it's a 50 bucks a month and it includes a device that can be uh, reimbursed you know up to $200 or $250 i mean it could be basically sort of the framework of almost like the emergency broadband benefit program the ebb but basically just another version of that uh, that would be the that's kind of the starting point and that's where i would say the default lies like if the fcc is just going to default they'll probably just default back to that okay it's a monthly service with the price up to a certain amount for devices boom go forward uh, the the risk there to me is all of that lost opportunity uh, first of all that sounds a lot like the ebb program and there already is an ebb program right. uh, you know so how can we expand the solutions? How can we bring more opportunities for libraries to keep their communities connected, to uh, extend connectivity you know, out to their patrons? And I think that's why it's important to make that point. Hey, this is, you know, we, we, we've got other opportunities, other options here. FCC allow us to do that. Uh, John, you make uh, a good point about the possibility of being limited to, you know, cell services by commercial providers, uh, that, that seems antithetical to the changes in the E-rate program that has opened it up for non-commercial providers, nonprofits and, and municipalities and county governments as well to supply those services, which should not be excluded from this. I mean, I, that just makes no sense. But just stepping back for a moment, You've identified, uh, uh, you know, the the meta issues around this, and so what we're hoping is, I think, that uh, individual library library systems would submit a comment that relates to their circumstance. So this is what we've done. This is what we would like to do. This is what's happened. You know. This is how, these are the benefits we've experienced or the benefits we anticipate from taking this approach and, and make it, you know, at the, at the micro level, at the, you know, the personal level. And, and that since, since most libraries don't have access to, you know, all the studies and statistics, uh, I, I would pose that their most effective filing could be in, you know, making a personal statement about how it affects their communities and the people in them. Uh, we've seen, well, there was one from uh, a library in Texas who's partnered with the WISP to use their existing commercial system to support students at home. And then we provide them a small grant to use that same, uh, it's actually 2.5 gigahertz EBS system, based system to support a handful of uh, public access stations. So that's a service. It's a really low cost. They're doing these for like $10 a month uh, because they're just supporting the community like a lot of WISP do. But they, she told the story of a, of a, a mother uh, or a family where a dad has to drive the car every day. And so they don't, they don't have a second car. They have five children. <laughs> And they're, you know, they've had to study from home. And so having a, uh, a station in the neighborhood where they could actually, you know, it's not the best thing, but it's something, but it's a, so much better than nothing. And I think that often gets overlooked is the value of something in the context of nothing or next to nothing and that that's valuable for, for people. So telling those kind of stories, I think, is a way to kind of push this forward rather than just putting a face on it. So. I'll, I'll give you an example. And I think we're going to have Steve actually kind of talk about how to file comments. Uh, the, so I had a, a meeting with the FCC staff yesterday and we're talking through some of these ideas and our, our proposal for using the category two type budget and a broad eligible services list. And, you know, the, the question they asked is they said, well, how, how in the world could USAC administer this if, if a school could just buy whatever end user device they needed and, and equipment associated with that? 
And I sort of flipped it around and said, it, how could, um, if you narrowly define it, how could USAC administer that? And the example I gave them, as I said, you know, sometimes when they, do, they buy a, a Chromebook, they may want a case for that Chromebook to keep it safe. So that, you know, if a student drops it or something, so that makes really good sense. If you're giving out a bunch of devices and you want it protected, uh, if if you tell if you tell the the uh, the schools and the libraries that cases aren't eligible, now do they have to cost allocate that? So when they submit their invoice to USAC and there's a you know it, the Chromebook came with the case on it, do they have to like split out five dollars for that case and? And how do you document that? I said, that is actually a much more work for USAC, for the applicant, than you just saying, hey, let us know what you bought, but end user devices, whatever kind of associated pricing equipment you need are eligible. So uh, you may, may, may or may not agree with that particular example, but for USAC, I mean, they never even thought about something like that. They had never thought about the fact that, oh, it's, you know, when you're, when you're dealing with the realm of end user devices, it's, it's, it's very different than just some core piece of equipment that it's got a model number and this should be eligible or not. You know, it's, it's, it's much more organic and messy once you it's start great, dealing with individuals. That's a great point. And I, I agree with you. You know, if we're gonna do this, why not trust the judgment of these local institutions, you know, to cover an implementation, which is it could be all of those elements, those physical elements, in addition to implementation services, in addition to, you know, carrier services. It should be whatever they think is their best use. Uh, why are we trying to second guess people that will, they're, they're the ones that are most invested. It's their community, their students, uh, give them the latitude. That would be, wouldn't that be the simplest to administer? I, I think it's actually quite simple. You rely on certifications. We certify this is for this educational purpose, and then it's all documented. You know, the uh, the one of the things the E-rate system does well is documentation, data, and documentation. And that's why we're saying, hey, there's still this isn't just money flying out the door that you never know where it went. It is. It is. You know, the application specifies where the funds are going. There's a good documentation trail that's all captured. So those things can be audited and reviewed uh, to make sure someone didn't go out and, you know, buy a car or something with that money. You know, we, we've got to guard against that. So uh, making the case that there should be flexibility uh, and then a good, good documentation trail. And those two things together in, for an emergency program are about as good as it can get. There's so I, I think case. Steve needs to there's join us. But benefit to that. Hmm? John, there's a third benefit to that is that documentation creates a, a, a foundation for learning, right? As you were pointing out, what do we do next? Well, we will have learned a lot by, by having all these various approaches and assessing those and saying, okay, this is the experience we've had. So it's reasonable in an emergency situation to uh, allow additional risks or less control than we normally would if it were, you know, a, a normal circumstance. But that has the, the carry-on benefit to learn uh, from the uh, innovations, the experimentation that people will do if you give them the latitude. And so the successes and the failures will all, you know, uh, be become assets. Mm -hmm. So, but hey, before Steve finally gets to talk, because he's excited, I'm kind of enjoying actually just watching him almost talk. Uh, I'm, I want to, I'm going to put in the chat here a link to the uh, annual survey that Funds for Learning conducts. And if you, if you prepare E-rate forms, I'm going to ask you to please take that. It averages eight minutes. <clears throat> this is our 11th year doing it. These statistics are, are cited by the FCC. Uh, we, we submit all this information into the public docket. We don't do anything with it other than just bundle it all together. The responses are kept confidential. Uh, but I, I would ask you to please just take eight minutes and complete that survey today. Last year, we had 9.9% .9 of all applicants take this survey. So almost just shy of 10%. 
and it provides a, a great wealth of information about the E-rate program, how effective it is, what areas can improve. And it's, uh, it's a very useful information for the FCC. They themselves cannot go out and do this type of survey. If they do, they have to go to OMB. It, it almost takes an act of Congress for them to conduct a survey. Uh, right. So uh, this is something that they've grown to trust, rely upon, and your input would be very, very appreciated. So good, thanks, Steve. Yes, hey, I, I, before I go into to my presentation and help to try to demystify the comment process, I want to I want to just weigh in a little bit. You at the last part there, you talked a little bit about what kind of documentation, what kind of review um, is necessary. And keep in mind, that's a balance the commission is trying to make um, with their necessity to supervise the, the expenditures of the funds to make sure that it is done efficiently. There's not waste or fraud and abuse. Um, and the thing I wanna point out is there are a lot of systems that already address those sorts of things, the existing E-rate systems, um, plus the interim systems that the commission has put in place for the telehealth reimbursement process, round one and round two now for the EBB. And, and they've drawn a lot on that in the ECF as well. So, you know, a lot of those questions about how much is gonna be enough and what kind of review I think you're gonna draw on, on those experiences. Um, where I think there's an opportunity for individual libraries to weigh in is on your staffing, your capabilities, the burdens that some of the more onerous review processes would put on the applicant itself. I think the commission's very sensitive to that. So being able to explain the resources is important there. And I, I just want to leave that part of it. Um, Don, I'm going to I'm going to share my screen and show just a little bit of what I what I put together here for you all um, on the filing process. And this document is um, I've sent it to Don so he can he can certainly share it. And um, oh, sorry. And I will, um, I'm happy to make it available. There we go. Hopefully everybody can see it. Yep. Uh, yeah, okay. All right. So uh, the first couple slides on this really are my presentation from last week, um, slightly updated. So I left it here for those people who asked for this documentation. This is what the Emergency Connectivity Fund um, covers, what the legislation covers. Eligible equipment is defined, connected devices are defined, um, and then there are all these other questions. I did this slide comparing the emergency broadband benefit and the emergency connectivity fund, the two major ones out there and sort of some differences in time as well as the targets and the approaches. So this is really more for reference. Um, what I want to do is give you a little bit of an idea on how to file comments, because many of you may not have filed comments. And the way I would say it is this, those Shelby questions are really, really good as a starting point. Um, treat them as, a, as you would like a menu at a restaurant, right? You do not, do not feel like you have to respond to all of those questions, or you have to try to weigh in on everything. Don't make this more difficult. Pick the one or two or the few that um, you have something to say on and focus on that. And, and I, I do believe, as I said at the beginning of this, you know, this is a program that is designed to benefit libraries, to benefit schools, and to solve a problem that they have with remote access. So the commission does wanna hear from you and I think they wanna hear specifics. That's your opportunity to give them something clear something um, as specific as possible that helps them to understand the impact of the decisions that they're gonna make. Um, filings at the FCC are, are rather simple, really. Um, it is a very flexible format. You know, A letter to the FCC is enough. You don't have to do anything more. You don't have to create a formal pleading. There's no pleading style that's required here. If you do it as a letter, 
um, simply address it to the FCC secretary and I put the uh, secretary's name and the address in here. Um, and then, you know, write your comment in. If you choose to use a caption, this is what the caption looks like for this particular program. Um, so just put that at the top of your, um, your document, put a title, reply comments of so-and-so, and then start in paragraph format your comments. Um, they should reference the docket number, docket 21-93. Um, and then just really, whoops, let me go back up. Um, here's what I, I suggest and really just try and get you to the idea here. You know, state that you're providing these comments in response to the public notice, just to frame everything. Um, start with just a sentence or two identifying the entity that's submitting the comments, a public library, your consortium, your whatever it is so that they know the perspective you are coming from. Um, briefly state your position and this is where I would suggest you take those comment, those questions from Shelby. You know, we are gonna weigh in on the, whether there should be a category two budget or we're gonna weigh in on whether the commission should expand the list of eligible services that um, are permitted in this program. And then provide an explanation really of why you support that position or how the money will help you to solve the pandemic challenge. That's I, I think the key thing here. I look at it for comments like this or entities like this, right? Funds for Learning and Shelby and others have done a lot of the heavy lifting of framing the big question and the big picture on this. Um, what the, the challenge of where you can get the most bang for your buck is providing something specific and useful to the commission that they can then cite in the order that the people are writing right now. And so, you know, the more direct you are, the more specific you can be. You know, I don't, I, I, don't support a, you know, a lengthy, the, the um, let's say the, the a lengthy um, competitive bidding process. Why? Well, because we don't really have that. We typically don't have a lot of bidders, you know, whatever our experience is, provide your examples in that and submit that with an eye towards, this is something the FCC is gonna note in a sentence and have a footnote cite to your comments on it. That's the way in which these have the most impact on the order and on the ultimate outcome. So specific examples, concrete examples of how it impacts you on these areas, that's what works. If you can comment on two, three issues, that's fine. If you can only comment on one, that's fine. Every one of those will help in the big process. Um, the steps are pretty easy here, and I'll, I got one more page to show you um, what it looks like. But again, I put all this out there in case those of you, are some, some of you may be the first time filing at the FCC. Create your document, save it as a PDF. Go to that link there, the ECFS, the um, Electronic Communications Filing, Electronic Comment Filing System, what it stands for. That will give you um, the form, and I'll show you the form in a minute. You enter the docket, you enter the information necessary on the form, you upload your PDF, you click submit, it'll ask you to confirm that, and then you're done. But just remember, your comments are public, right? So if there's something you can't put in there, or you know, you don't want to share specific pricing information or specific, um, you know, uh, partners that you're working with, et cetera, that's fine. Don't just don't put it in there. What you send is going to be public and publicly accessible. This is what it looks like. Um, the proceeding number again. So in here you put 2193. Name of the filer. This is not the person submitting it. This is the organization. Um, the person submitting will be down here under attorney or author name, contact email, it's a reply comment. And then there's a bunch more fields down here. Most of them are gonna be empty for you. Um, you only have to submit the, um, the address information. That's the only piece I didn't show on this. So that's really done the filing process. Um, I will stop sharing so I can see questions and all. And then um, I'm happy to discuss 
anything people want to know about how to submit them or you know how to frame a specific comment if you want. Very good, Steve. Just the nicest, straightforward step process for doing a filing that I've seen. And it, it is not that complicated. And I, I really echo your point about the value of, of individual stories and individual circumstances uh, that the large filers, the associations, will be making these macro points about the values of, of this approach or that approach, but, but a different voice from individual uh, uh, practitioners, who, it, it will affect uh, what they what they uh, see. Um, could you you put your email in the slide? Could you put it in the chat for everybody because we've got a number of people who would like to get a copy of those slides. Uh, if unless you have a place that's posted uh, that people could go to, so we don't have. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll put it in here. Yeah. And store and forward files anywhere. Um, but an interesting uh, question from Charmaine uh, about the prospect of creating a, a new category, a category three that uh, is free from a lot of the requirements under the uh, category one and two that may alleviate the need to kind of shoehorn things or provide exceptions to certain requirements under the two categories. Does that make any sense to you, Steve or John? Yeah. I, I'll go first and John will let you do it. Um, so, the, you know, this system operates outside of the E-rate system. The funding comes from outside the C-rate, E-rate. The FCC as a practical matter is gonna have to leverage as much of the E-rate process as possible. So this is really sort of gonna exist in its own separate sphere anyway but it's just gonna operate similar to the way in which people are familiar with an E-rate. So I think, I, I don't know whether category three, you know, is necessary in this kind of situation. The FCC has to put some kind of um, parameters on how the money can be spent, what it can be spent for, and um, what documentation it needs for that. Yeah, I, th I think the, the, the heart and soul of, of what uh, Charmaine said there is spot on. You know, what, what they call it, I, I think is not, you know, it's, that's, they're gonna probably call it whatever they call it. But I think the, the heartbeat of what you said, hey, leverage your existing forms and systems for a separate application for the ECF. And then your, your parenthetical there at the end is probably the most important thing for you to comment on is, and it goes to Steve's point, hey, the competitive bidding doesn't make sense in this case because in our experience, blah, 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 or we think SIPA should not be required or, or filtering should be paid for, or you, know, you can kind of list out your own experience. That's, that's, that's what they are looking for. And you know, Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, but in, in sort of layman's terms, the FCC is not allowed to have their own opinion, right? I mean, so like, they have to build these orders off of the facts and the information that's before them. So that's why it's so important that they can point to, uh, you know, such and such uh, library says this. Is, is that generally kind of correct? Right, right. Yeah, they are they are an expert agency, but their opinions have to be based upon the, rec the record evidence and their evaluation of the record. So if they're going to say that, you know, the um, applicants are not able to conduct competitive bidding, just to pick an example. They need evidence to show that, that is not possible, that that opinion that they have made is based upon record evidence. And that's where the specific comments or examples or things that you can add into this will have that impact. Uh, they also have opinions about uh, what the law means and what they can and can't do is we saw Pi opine on uh, the inability to use these funds to, you know, support remote uh, study before this program was announced. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's correct. And, and, and I'm assuming for this, right, we're talking about the reply comments now. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, a lot of that is 
sketched out already. And again, you can rely upon, I think the others, the other hundred that have filed so far to carry that water, right? The yeah. real question here is what's the real impact on the ground of these specific proposals? And so I would say, take those Shelby questions, go through them, decide the ones that you have the most to say on that, that would impact you the most and submit a short comment that covers, you know, one, two, three of those, however many you can, you can have something to say on. Yeah, I think that's the crux of our, our, our purpose of our workshop today was to make that point uh, and to encourage people to weigh in and as they support any of those uh, positions, so much better if they can actually illuminate the impact of those particular decisions on their circumstance, either what they expect or what has already happened. That this is, yeah, we make policy at the national level, but things happen at the low, everything happens at the local level. And we don't know exactly, we're guessing. And so that's the point of, of getting this, uh, uh, these filings at the local level. Anybody, uh, John makes the point that these are due on the April the 23rd is a week from today. Uh, and so they're not so complicated, but it's really an opening to make a difference uh, by telling these stories. Stories are just effective. Once you hear a powerful story, you can't forget it. Uh, even if nobody is supporting it with specific data, it's just the way we the way we're influenced. And I would include the F even the FCC is influenced by <laughs> stories as, uh, as Stephen Abram made the point. Anybody else uh, have, a, have an issue that they're trying to uh, resolve uh, in this context uh, that they'd like to put? I mean, you have an opportunity here. Yeah, yeah. I, I was gonna say, or Don, or, or set it up this way. I mean, if anybody has a, a question or a thought and they're not sure how to, to frame that for the FCC, you know, that's something John or I can, can assist you with and we can take some of the time we have now to go through that if anybody wants to share. Well, I'm, I'm looking. Okay. John? Mala, yes. Mala. Um, I, I kind of spaced out a little bit uh, while uh, the conversation was going on. I don't know if you answered uh, the second question that I asked. Uh, that was about uh, households when they apply, um, let's say in the first month or second month, are they assured that they would get six months of coverage or are they on pins and needles about what if the money gets um, you know, used up by the second month or the third month. This is for EBB. The, the EBB question, right? Yeah. Right. So, so the program is about to start. I don't, unless they announced it today, they have not yet announced the exact start date. Um, but that only carries six months of funding after the end of the, um, the, the pandemic um, or if the money runs out. I'm already seeing discussions about whether or not they need to add more money to the EBB and whether Congress will do so. Um, I, I think the specific answer to your question is that those individual recipients don't have any guarantee beyond six months and um, the commission wants to make sure that there is a transition or an opportunity for a transition at the end of that. Um, so there was some discussion about what that would look like, but it wouldn't be with government funding. Once the funding is done, it will have to go to, you know, lifeline programs or to some other program, not the EBB. Steve, my question, uh, I just want to clarify, is not just about the six months, it's even within the six months, not beyond it. If I sign up today or when, when it opens up, Am I guaranteed that I will get six months of coverage? Or at the end of the first month, if there are enough applicants, the money runs out and I don't get coverage beyond that first month? Yeah, I, I, I would have to go back and look. I think the way it's set up is that um, 
the, the commission will continue to provide funding for six months um, after it declares that the program is going to end. So I think everybody is gonna get guaranteed at least six months of service. But I need to double, I would need to double check that and I can um, follow up with you offline on that. Thank you. You've got Steve's uh, address there in the chat, uh, uh, Mala. Uh, uh, John posted the Shelby question list there at link uh, for Steve's suggestion to go through those items and pick your pick your points to address. Um, okay, we're a little bit over here. I'm just looking for any more uh, urgent questions. Anyone else? Okay, all right. Well, I think we'll close the recorded session now. And uh, and and thank you, Steve. John had to leave for another uh, another webinar. Uh, it's how we live today, where we. We all we're all webinaring ourselves. Uh, we'll have a session one day on that and um, on that very thing. Is this what's this doing to how we relate to each other? And uh, but not today. Okay, all right. I think we've stopped the recording.